It's often said that, due to the nature of the modes of their production, in movies the director is king and the writer is an afterthought. But on television, the writer is king and the director is an afterthought. Resurrector makes a strong argument for the importance of a great TV director. We open with an obvious nod to the first shot of The Godfather with Mel Kirby, played by the great character actor Greg Travis, explaining how he desperately wants to make the move from radio to television. Of course, the person he's asking for help is Lucas Buck. And we get some excellent cinematography from Stephen McNutt, who served in that role for every episode of the series except for the pilot. Lucas asks Mel what he brings to the table, but Mel doesn't have anything to offer. Lucas blows him off and tells him he's got no future, which is generally a phrase used to dismiss someone, but when Lucas says it, it really means something. Mel threatens Lucas and storms out to finish our cold open, and you know that that's not going to go well for Mel. At the Holt house, Caleb digs into some pancakes and shares with Loris that Merlin has been talking to him. Laura says she's not surprised and that Caleb needs to do a ritual to release Merlin from this plane. But I don't want Merlin gone, I want her here. Well, she's not here, Caleb. And the best thing you can do for her now is to let her know that you've accepted that. At WIX, Mel and his wife Gloria are hosting their morning talk show. And we can see right away that they're not going anywhere. Mel is the same generic shock comic that exists at every talk radio station. What's wrong with relationships? Nothing, love bug. But why do we have to talk about them? You see, women talk, men act. Oh my god, Mel, you can't say that. It's so misogynistic and offensive. No. They go through some wacky callers, one of whom is recognizably Selena Coombs. And she implies that she's been sleeping with Mel. Since you're talking about relationships, why don't you tell your wife about ours? I don't know what you're talking about. No time for that, though, because the next caller is Gene Biggs, whose husband Lance has a shotgun is in the middle of a breakdown. Deputy Ben shows up and tries to reason with him, and when that doesn't work, Ben storms the house and winds up shooting Lance in self-defense. All of this is being broadcast over the radio because Mel thinks he can exploit it. Chloe, I think I can make this work for us. True to form, Mel shows up at the hospital and badgers Ben into sarcastically convincing to shooting Lance, because the latter owed money to Lucas Buck. What, the guy owed Lucas money? Fine, so I shot him. <laughs> you don't leave me alone, I might shoot you too. Smooth, Ben. Real smooth. Caleb enlists Boone's help in performing the ritual for Merlin. Boone is skeptical, but Caleb has the perfect response to what about This ain't like that. Boone screws up the list of necessary items, buying cornflakes instead of frosted flakes. Cornflakes. They're... okay. Lucas surprises Gloria at the station to plant seeds of doubt about Mel. Gloria offers a lukewarm defense, but Lucas asks her if Mel is ambitious enough to throw her under the bus for fame and fortune. Did he say something specific to you about our marriage? No, man. Not a thing. Selena catches Ben at the local watering hole and offers to take him for another ride. Benji is hesitant, but Selena promises this isn't a Lucas Buck errand this time. At the sheriff's office, Mel blackmails Lucas with the tape of Ben, threatening to open the show with it every morning unless Lucas reconsiders the TV offer. Lucas says he's already talked to the TV station. There's an offer on the table. But for Mel, and Mel alone, he'd have to dump Gloria. Literally. We get our second great shot of the episode, one that recalls the Oliver Parker version of Othello, which would come out just nine days after the airing of this episode. You've been waiting for your big break to come, and it hasn't. Why? You obviously have the talent, but something's been holding you back. In the backyard, Caleb and Boone send an invitation to Merlin and then burn all of her favorite things. Boone seems nonplussed, so Caleb accuses Boone's skepticism for being the reason Merle isn't showing up. I'm sorry, Caleb. That's why she hasn't come yet. It's cause you don't believe. It's cause you don't believe. Boone walks off, and that's when Merlin calls for Caleb. In her first appearance since rebirth, Merlin apparates in a tornado of fire and desperately clutches for Caleb, scaring him off. Miss Holt tells Caleb to stop all the foolishness and let Merlin rest in peace. And if we take it from everyone else's point of view, it's bittersweet how everyone around Caleb thinks that they're humoring this sad and disturbed little boy. I'm sorry, Caleb. That's why she hasn't come yet. It's cause you don't believe. It's cause you don't believe. At the station, Gloria has to go it alone because Mel was gone all night. He stumbles in with five o'clock shadow and swears he wasn't with another woman, just alone with his thoughts which is the worst kind of infidelity. Gloria makes a date for a boat ride with Mel, which is an odd makeup date. He's just called in and he's feeling much better. 
As a matter of fact, he wants to take me for a boat ride on Jackson Lake. Lucas tells him that it's the perfect opportunity to dump the dead weight. Caleb sneaks a peek at Loris' old scrapbook and learns that he needs sulfur to finish the ritual. But Lucas appears and breaks the bottle of sulfur. He also gives Caleb a warning that Merlin might be dangerous for him. My sister needs me. Your sister might just eat you alive. It's time to give up the ghost, son. We get another great shot as the camera cranes upward to a medium close shot on Lucas's face. See there? Father knows best. Outside the station, Selena makes it very clear that she's available should Mel ever want to touch that dial. So with a dream job offer on the table from the TV station and a dream job offer from Selena on the table, bed, couch, and other places, everything seems to be coming up Mel. The only thing standing in the way is Gloria. That night, Mel and Gloria row onto the lake alone. Mel seems conflicted, but when Gloria falls out of the boat and seems to get stuck on something, Mel is faced with a choice. Save Gloria or leave her to drown. You're caught? You shot me! Mel rows his way to what he thinks is a lifetime of fame and hot sex. Lucas rules it death by misadventure and congratulates Mel on his newfound success. Now, is there anything you'd like to say to me? Thanks. Mel returns to the station to get drunk, and that's when Selena skulks out of the shadows to comfort him. Mel admits that he didn't even try to save Gloria. Almost drowned pretending to save her. What? Of course, the TV cameras were running, so Mel does get famous for being on TV. Lucas held up his end of the bargain. Oh, and Gloria is still alive. Turns out she's a very good swimmer. This leads to one of my favorite Lucas lines. I came to you for help. Step into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. In the coda, Caleb returns Merle's locket, the one that he took in the pilot episode, and this triggers the supernatural geyser and the return of Merlin. Except, Merle seems to have come back with a vengeance. Now we'll be done. And we're out. Resurrector is another in a handful of episodes that demonstrates what the show could be as a loose anthology. Here the mythology returns to B-plot status to plant the seeds for all hell breaking loose in the next episode, while Lucas's trap is laid for some one-off characters. American Gothic is at its best in episodes like this and damned if you don't, where Lucas becomes more avenging angel than devil. Of course, Lucas is still plenty evil, but there's enough greed, lust, and jealousy in Trinity to go around. It's another tight script worked on by Gagan, Perry, and series creator Sean Cassidy, and it feels workmanlike in the best way. I hate you. And someday we'll make that hate work for you. There's something to be said for a well-built, no-frills structure after all. The standout is director Elodie Keene, who unfortunately only directed one episode of the series. Keene has directed everything from L.A. Law to Glee to Pretty Little Liars, and everything in between. If it was big on television, Elodie Keene probably directed an episode. This episode looks and feels like a lot of care was taken with the visuals save for the mid-90s goosebump level effects, but that's always been part of the show's charm. The lighting and the camera work are a cut above most other episodes in the series, and it was the first inkling that this show could be cinematic as well as gothic. But on deck, we have a good old-fashioned good versus evil deathmatch. <laughs>